Hello friends, in this video today I'm going to offer some general advice on how you can select the appropriate replacement capacitors to get your vintage computers or old electronic devices up and running again. I'd like to start out by just giving you a little reasoning behind this video. Uh, recently, one of the PayPal contributors to this YouTube channel had asked me how I go about selecting capacitors. How do I choose among the different brands like Nichicon and Panasonic? Uh, what are things like ROHS? Uh, how do I pick out the right capacitors, uh, the size, the lead spacing, and all of that? What He asked me basically what are my uh, techniques and the thinking that goes into it. Now, full disclosure, I do have an electrical engineering degree. That doesn't mean I know everything. And some of you who are just, you know, hobbyists or technicians may have a, a, a lot more experience in a certain area than I do. So I'm not trying to make myself out to be some kind of know-it-all, but at the same time, I do know the theory behind it. And I do understand appropriate capacitor selection and some of the pitfalls. And so that's what I'm going to try to convey to you in this video today. I should also point out that if there is a specific video or help guide that is going to provide all of the details you really need uh, to recap, for example, uh, Macintosh 128K analog board, then obviously that video is going to be better than this one because this video is just offering you general advice. And by the way, I, I would suggest that you go to my channel and click on the little magnifying glass and then you can search and you'll find all of my different videos on those topics. Uh, I even have videos on recapping the 128K motherboard, recapping floppy drives and, and uh, things like that, which you normally don't find on other channels. So uh, because I provide not only details on how to recap, but I also provide the Mauser carts necessary that you just buy it and then watch the video to replace the capacitors, that really is the easiest approach. Uh, in the event I don't have a video, there are places online that sell capacitor kits. One of the companies, I've never purchased from them, and I don't have an affiliation with them, but Console 5 is one of the companies that I've uh, read that many of you in the vintage Mac and other vintage computing uh, communities have used to recap your Macs or Commodore 64s or other uh, vintage computing devices. They don't have a kit for everything, though. So uh, it is possible that ultimately you're going to have to choose your own capacitors one day. And that's really what this video is all about. The first step is to decide what capacitors need replacing. There are a variety of capacitor types and you do not need to replace them all. What you're going to keep your eyes on are the fluid filled aluminum electrolytic capacitors that usually have a cylindrically shaped body. And these capacitors come in three types. The first type is surface mount, also known as SMD or SMT capacitors. These have tiny little legs that come out the sides and mount to the top or surface of the circuit board. The second type are radial capacitors. They have legs that come straight out the bottom and they go through two drill holes that go straight through your circuit board. The third and final type are axial capacitors. These are very similar to radials, except that they are laid down on their sides. The legs come out each side of the capacitor and they need to be bent down at a 90 degree angle and go straight through the two drill holes on the circuit board. Now, you don't need to worry about uh, most other capacitor types, such as film capacitors uh, or ceramic capacitors or tantalum capacitors. These capacitors do not have um, a fluid electrolyte. There are wet tantalums, but probably you're not going to find them on your vintage boards. So in those cases, you really don't have to worry about them. Now, if you were handed a board that was recapped with tantalum capacitors, solid tantalum, I mean, then in that case, you might need to replace some of them if they were inappropriately chosen. And the reason why is because tantalum if inappropriately chosen, can go up in flames. There are a lot of people who are tantalum haters out there, and I am not one of them. Neither is NASA. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. NASA uses solid tantalums in the space program. They're even used in pacemakers. The military uses them. So if they were as dangerous as some of the tantalum haters contend, they would no longer be sold today. The fact is, 
uh, they are safe when used appropriately. And I will admit that the, the ones used in pacemakers in the medical field and the military in space, they go through some very rigorous testing. Those are on a magnitude better than what you would find uh, on Mauser being sold to the commercial or industrial or consumer markets. But nevertheless, solid tantalum is solid tantalum and it can burn if given the uh, right voltage conditions. And really that's what triggers it most of the time is excessive voltage. So I'll go in more into detail in that, but basically if you see ceramic capacitors or tantalum capacitors or film capacitors on your board, unless they're cracked or noticeably burned, you really don't have to worry about replacing those types. You're going to be focusing uh, primarily on aluminum electrolytic capacitors. There is one exception to that rule, and those are the safety capacitors that you'll find uh, usually in the power supply circuit. Uh, for example, on a Macintosh 128K analog board, there are three RIFA safety capacitors uh, right near where the AC voltage comes in. And those capacitors don't often fail and they don't leak out a, a fluid electrolyte uh, that will eat away traces or anything like that. So it's not absolutely necessary that you replace uh, those type of safety capacitors. However, uh, RIFA boxes do have a plastic outer shell and if you see that that is cracked, then in that case I would recommend you replace them. If those fail, uh, those especially on the Macintosh motherboard, uh, they usually will crack open, uh, explode, not a big explosion, but basically crack open and sometimes they'll ooze some black goo out. Um, but even if you replace or actually remove those capacitors on an analog board on a vintage Macintosh, usually it will still work and the reason why is because those capacitors are there to filter noise. I found an excellent video on the subject if you want to learn more and I have that linked in the text description below, but suffice it to say, if you're already recapping the aluminum electrolytic capacitors, uh, then you can just easily add those other safety capacitors to your cart. And in the case of the analog board, I already have a video on that. I have the Mauser cart set up to include those capacitors. But in terms of the general advice that I'm giving you now on a ma machine not covered in my videos, um, yes, you could give a secondary look at those safety capacitors because they are the first line of attack. That's where the AC voltage comes in, where the lightning strikes happen, where all of the noise comes in. And uh, so they can go bad. So that's something else to consider when you're replacing these capacitors. Now that you know what kind of capacitors you need to replace, we need to talk about how to choose appropriate replacements. Basically, there are four important criteria that you need to give due consideration to. Number one is capacitance. This is often printed on a vinyl label around the capacitor itself. Next is voltage. This is the maximum voltage specification of the capacitor, very often also printed on that vinyl uh, sheath that goes around the capacitor body. Uh, next is the physical size of the capacitor itself in terms of its diameter and its height. And lastly, we have the lead spacing. Now, capacitance and voltage, again, they are often printed on the label itself, but if your label is damaged uh, or you just don't have it on there, then you're going to have to find some other way to figure out what the capacitance and voltage is. One way is to desolder and remove the capacitor from the circuit so that you can uh, measure that outside the circuit and determine what the capacitance is. Keep in mind though, if your capacitor is very old and has leaked out a lot of fluid, it very well could be that the capacitance is way off and so any measurement that you <laughs> Uh, measure on that capacitor may not accurately tell you what that capacitor was originally. So in that case, it's often best to have a schematic and that's not always easy to find and sometimes it's absolutely impossible to find. But um, there is one other technique you can use. If you search for whatever that board is or whatever the device is or computer uh, using Google, sometimes you can go into Google Images and 
and you'll be able to find a high enough resolution photo of the actual board and maybe if normally that capacitance and voltage is printed on the actual components, you might find the component in a photo that exists on the internet and you can just read it off of that. But a schematic would be uh, really the best thing to have in the event you're, you're not able to uh, see what that capacitance and voltage is on the capacitor itself. Now in terms of measuring capacitance, I would highly recommend this DE5000 meter. You've probably seen me use this in some of my other recapping videos. Uh, this is really the best handheld LCR meter you can find. L standing for inductance, C standing for capacitance, and R standing for resistance. Uh, really the accuracy of this is very comparable to benchtop meters costing, costing hundreds of dollars. Now this maybe not is not something that's worth buying if you're only going to do one recapping job because this plus some of these removable accessories will set you back about a hundred US dollars. But uh, if you're a geek, then okay, it's definitely worth it. Um, you're not going to be able to measure voltage. Okay, I think most of you who are familiar with these tools can understand that. This is for measuring capacitance or measuring the ESR, the resistivity of uh, capacitors. Uh, you cannot measure the voltage spec, right? Because, well, how do you know what that is? Um, so even though you can measure the capacitance, you still may not know the voltage. And in that case, um, I wouldn't suggest that you guess based upon the physical size of the capacitors because the capacitors for, uh, that were used in electronics in the 1980s and early 1990s uh, are different than those used today. Today, modern fluid-filled electrolytic capacitors, not always, but many times are smaller, uh, sometimes substantially smaller, so you can't really base it uh, on the size of the capacitor itself. And again, that's where a schematic would really come in handy or asking people in online forums uh, to help you out there it can be a benefit. But sometimes you can guess based upon the voltages going into the board. For example, an SE30 motherboard, we know that it's taking 5 volts and 12 volts from the power supply. So 12 volts is the upper end voltage that you're going to see. And so that's why uh, on the SE30 motherboard, we see 47 microfarad, 16 volt uh, capacitors on there. There's 10 of them. And uh, that way you know, okay, it's the voltage of these capacitors needs to be higher than that highest voltage that the motherboard sees. But as an engineer, I'm not really too hip on guessing. I mean, if, if, if that's all you can do, then, well, that's all you can do, but uh, try your best to, tr to find out whatever technical information you can so that you can be sure of the exact capacitance and voltage before you pick out a replacement capacitor. Now, in the four-step criterion for picking out replacement capacitors, in addition to capacitance and voltage, we talked about the diameter of the capacitor, the height of the capacitor, and the lead spacing. And I would also strongly recommend that you purchase something like this uh, Mitsutoyo uh, caliper set. Uh, calipers are, you've probably seen these before, even if you have never used them or don't own them. Uh, these are digital calipers, so they have a LCD screen and um, just like shown on the picture here, uh, it lets you go down to 0.1 or actually 0 0.01 millimeters, which is uh, a very, very tight tolerance. Uh, you could easily measure the diameter of a 5.1 millimeter capacitor and you, you're going to need to do that because you want to measure the width or the diameter and also the height of the capacitor so that of the stock capacitor so that you know approximately the height and width of the replacement capacitor you need. In addition to that, you also need to use your calipers, which again are much easier to use than a standard ruler. Uh, you need to use your calipers to measure around your capacitor. So your capacitor might, for example, uh, be this capacitor and it's sitting right next to a connector. Okay, so if this capacitor is say 10 millimeters wide and it's sitting right next to 
a connector and the only replacement capacitor you can find is 12 millimeters wide, you're going to have a problem because that wouldn't fit there. So you need to measure and figure out what is the maximum area that you have around your capacitor, both in height and in width, and that will help you to better pick out the appropriate replacement. Because again, you may not, in, in many cases, the modern replacement capacitors are going to be smaller than the original stock capacitors, but not always. Uh, the capacitor you need may be out of stock for weeks or even months sometimes. And so being able to know what the actual space you have available to you is extremely important so you can pick out the appropriate capacitor. You never want to buy a capacitor just based on capacitance and voltage alone because it may not fit. And the same goes for the lead spacing. How far apart are the two leads? Uh, because the drill holes, in many cases, if you have a through hole type of, uh, of a capacitor, you can measure the mountains of solder on the solder side of the board. That's kind of a more of a guessing game than complete precision, but it does work fairly well. Uh, if you want to be more precise, you can try to desolder the uh, capacitor and uh, measure from the middle of one drill hole to the middle of the next using your calipers, and they have the ability to do just that. Um, that is a more accurate way of doing it, but usually a rough estimate is good enough. And I should say that for very big capacitors like I'm holding in my hands here, these capacitors I consider to be large as opposed to a little tiny guy like this. The large capacitors are heavier, they're more susceptible to vibration, lead spacing is much more important for these. For example, if you have a five millimeter lead spacing and you buy a capacitor that has only two millimeter lead spacing, then you're going to have to stretch out those legs, right? For them to fit into that wider hole, which means that the base of the capacitor, its little bottom here, will not sit flush through the board. And for a bigger capacitor, that's a problem. If you've only got a one microfarad, 50 volt capacitor, even a 4.7 microfarad, th those are pretty small uh, for, for the low voltages you're dealing with there. And they can actually stand up on their legs. I have a video about the SE30 or, or Macintosh SE Sony power supply, and inside that you'll find a lot of those smaller value, lower voltage capacitors standing up on their legs because they're so lightweight and small it doesn't matter. But for the bigger capacitors, you want to make sure they sit flush with the board. In other words, if they're a radial capacitor, you want those legs to go straight down. You don't want them to be bent out. And that's why being able to measure with your calipers the appropriate lead spacing is critically important. And don't just base it upon capacitance values either, because in the same Sony power supply for the Macintosh SE and SE30, a 4.7 microfarad doesn't sound like much, and it isn't. A 4.7 microfarad capacitor that's rated at 350 volts is quite big. It's, it's maybe not quite as big as this one, but almost. And you want those capacitors, because of their physical size, to sit flush with the board and not standing up on their legs. And the last thing before we get on the computer and take a look at the Mauser website uh, that I want to add is that you may not always be able to find an exact replacement. That's especially true of older axial capacitors. Um, you may not be able to find that capacitance and voltage, even a higher voltage, um, if, even after much, much searching. Uh, it may not be a case of it's just out of stock. They may not make it anymore. Or you might be able to find one that's a tantalum that'll cost you $6 or even $15 or something crazy like that. I've seen them before. Um, that's uh, really made for something that is not vintage computing, maybe for the medical field or something like that. You really don't want to pay that much for one capacitor. Um, but there are times when you just can't find any equivalent axial at any price. And the good news is that you can use radials. You can use the radial capacitor and just bend out the legs. And I have one of my recapping videos that actually shows that. I did replace some of the axial leaded capacitors with radials 
and I bent out the legs and uh, usually there's enough length of those legs to where you can do that. Just make sure that you don't short out the legs across some other exposed piece of metal or trace. Uh, if, if there is anything like that on the board, then you need to buy heat shrink and insulate those legs uh, before they go down into the board. Also be aware of the height because axials are very low to the board, but a, a radial is much higher. And so if you have very cramped uh, space constraints. You need to sometimes bend those capacitors, lay them down flat, and then solder them in that way. So uh, yes, you can replace an axial with a radial, or you, you could replace a radial with an axial. I, I don't think you'd ever want to do that, but uh, they can be swapped out that way. Okay friends, here we are at the Mauser website. Uh, to begin, I'm just going to give you a basic overview and compare with the DigiKey site. The DigiKey site is largely comparable. You can see it has a search bar just like Mauser does up here. But um, the differences begin when you start typing in something. For, let's say we're going to search for 47 microfarad capacitors, 47 UF, and it immediately says, okay, do you want to search for capacitance or capacitance range? And I want to search for capacitance. And then it will do its thing. Now, the only thing I really don't like about Mauser is how long it takes. To me, it, that took too long. It shouldn't take that long. But that's a minor gripe. Other than that, I really don't have much complaints. Anyway, this is the screen that you normally see if you search based upon capacitors. And you can see here, all right, do we want to search in capacitors? And if so, we click this and we can see there's 8,202 pieces. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then once we search within capacitors, after it takes its sweet time, <laughs> then we have these categories here. We can choose tantalum or polymer or ceramic and film, uh, aluminum electrolytic capacitors. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do that. Aluminum electrolytic capacitors. And then once we're in here, then remember we talked about the different types. You've got axial leads, wires coming out the sides, radial leads, wires coming straight down, surface mount. Then we've got a snap-in type. Uh, then we have aluminum organic polymer. So these are the ones that uh, are newer tech, which have lower ESR. But we'll just say, okay, let's go to the aluminum electrolytic surface mount capacitors and then we're presented with other details that we can further narrow it down. Now before I get into any more detail I'll just go ahead and switch over to DigiKey and we'll do the same thing and you'll see the di differences right away. 47 microfarad and uh, well <laughs> it's not dropping down. Let me see if I can reload it and it'll drop down finally. 47 microfarad Sometimes it drops down and sometimes it doesn't. Oh well, it didn't drop down this time, so I'll just go ahead and search. And then it gives me this screen. We've got the different capacitor types that we can choose. Aluminum electrolytic capacitors, ceramic, blah, 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 blah. And yeah, aluminum electrolytic capacitors. And then of course it takes us here and you can see it's somewhat similar. You know, here's DigiKey, here's Mauser, switching back and forth. So you got the manufacturers and, and then, of course, the specific details. Um, and then if you were to pick, I don't know, just pick one at random, then the product web page looks something like this. And then if we just go down here and pick this guy at random, it's not the same capacitor, but we can kind of see the product page looks like this. So. The layout's a little bit different. Um, I guess it's just personal preference. It's largely the same, just some subtle differences. Maybe it's because I'm just used to uh, Mauser. I prefer it more. But the data sheets are always here, right? You don't have to scroll to find the data sheets. It's always here. And then you can put your customer number. This is the area that you can assign a label like you could say C12 if you're going to use this capacitor on a circuit board. And then when you actually order it, this will be printed on the label that's affixed to the little bag, which is kind of nice. And then, of course, you can put your thing in here in DigiKey. You also have a customer reference, so you can put whatever you want there. And, you know, 
type it in to get to the uh, data sheet. It's it's eluding me at the moment, but it's somewhere. Let's search for data. Not found. Okay, well, <laughs> then, uh, you know, I know they don't use DigiKey, so that you DigiKey fans will, will maybe spot it right away, but uh, I, just, I just prefer the layout of this better, you know, even though a lot of the things uh, are the same. And um, we can go back to our little list here, and then, of course, it lets us further narrow down what we want and maybe the capacitor you're trying to replace is rated at 16 volts and if so that's this voltage rating section here you choose 16 volts typically capacitors are are 20 percent tolerance sometimes for other capacitors you'll see 10 percent even five percent here those are going to be more expensive you really don't need to go lower than 20 percent i mean it's not going to hurt anything if you want to pay extra for a 10 percent tolerance capacitor but um, uh, for aluminum electrolytic capacitors anyway, uh, with a fluid-filled electrolyte, 20% is uh, actually your only choice here. But um, it's, all, it's all you need. So if you're wondering about it, you don't necessarily have to choose it. You can just reset it and not select it. But I just want to mention that because when you're choosing capacitors, you'll sometimes see more than just 20% there. I normally don't choose capacitors with ESR, so I kind of leave this blank. And then uh, for aluminum electrolytics, I always try to have a capacitor that's 105. You know, 85 isn't necessarily bad, but this determines the life of the capacitor. You can go higher if you want to pay more, but going with 105 is perfectly fine. And uh, if you really, really want to replace with an aluminum electrolytic capacitor, which means you're going to have to replace it again in 20 years, then uh, okay, you know, 105 degrees is what you really should shoot for. And only go with 85 if there's no other component in the size and capacitance and voltage that you want. And then remember we talked about the actual physical size of the capacitor, right? This lets you choose diameter, length, uh, height, if you want to narrow it down that way. So say we've got a, um, a diameter of the capacitor that's limited to 5 millimeter. Then we can choose that. And then of course over here it has life and typically you want to choose something high, a higher value to get a longer life. There are some differences in ESR between the hours so you might say okay well uh, maybe it's better to buy 2000 hour but honestly you know even if you compare the specs I personally would go with the higher hour parts for especially for aluminum electrolytics. And then, of course, down here it says in stock. So you, why would you want to see a list of capacitors that aren't in stock? Or in active, I usually check this mark too, just to make sure it's not an obsolete product that you're going to be able to continue to find it and so on. And then you've got this check mark here, ROHS compliant. ROHS compliant. And you might wonder, well, what is ROHS? And here we are, the explanation of uh, ROHS, which centers on lead-free compliance. It's not simply restricted to lead, but uh, basically the, the summary is the first sentence here. It's uh, designed to eliminate things that are dangerous to people and to the environment. Uh, so specifically, they want to eliminate lead, and then of course cadmium, and then all of these other little guys here including flame retardants and if you know anything about yellowing plastics uh, yes I definitely want to <laughs> eliminate flame retardants even if it goes up in a ball of fire a great ball of fire right uh, it, man that stuff makes your plastics yellow anyway ROHS is basically uh, saying if you if you see an ROHS compliant product then it's going to be free of lead and these other things and it makes your body happy and all that so then the question becomes, oh, it sounds good. You know, the more environmentally minded you are, th the greater it may sound. And you might think, okay, well, maybe that's, maybe I want to check this checkbox. But sometimes it'll cost you more. And honestly, if we're talking about soldering, I, I, I do not like lead-free solder. I honestly would not prefer to have 
a, a completely lead-free soldering environment. And of course, we're not ordering soldering here. We're talking about parts like capacitors and so on. Um, so it's it's really the c construction of these parts. Uh, do are they constructed without any of these things? And you know, sometimes the leads may be tinned. And if it's ROHS compliant, then it's not going to be tinned with leaded solder. It's going to be tinned with with something without lead. So it's really up to you. I never check this box because it's just not that important to me, and I don't want to diminish the the ideals of those of you who who feel that protecting the environment is is very important. Because I, I agree with it too. It's just a personal choice, and again, it, it it's going to perhaps limit the number of parts a little bit, and maybe even increase the price. So that's a choice that you can make whether you want it to. Be there or not. And I normally leave these two at the bottom unchecked, but again, these are your choices on whether you want to do that or not. And then once we have our filters set up, uh, then we can proceed to apply. Mauser again takes its sweet time here. And uh, wow, <laughs> it only found one part. Whenever it comes directly to a product page like this, it means it only found one capacitor that meets our criterion. So uh, this is the only choice. Now that doesn't mean that there are, are not other capacitors that might meet the criterion in terms of specifications. Uh, we'll go back and say out of stock include those parts too and then apply filters. Okay, well in this case it's um, well, let's uncheck active and see what happens. Okay, it's still the only part. Sometimes if you uncheck in stock and active, it'll give you more parts down here that you can choose from. But in this case, our restriction of 105 degrees C, 16 volts, 5 millimeter diameter, really restricted the part, especially because we wanted only 5,000 hour. Okay, and so if we say give me all of the 5,000 and 2,000 hours in stock and active and apply the filters. We'll see what it gives us here. And now it gives us a list of parts, quite a few of them actually. There's no page two down here. So these are, and it says here, results are 10. So we have 10 different ones from which we can choose. And then you can click the sorting here you know, if you want to sort by price, and you can see one piece is 20 cents, here's 36, and it, the price is going up. But the thing is, though, and this is the other thing I don't really care for, I, it sorts based upon the one piece qu quantity. Sometimes 50 pieces or 100 pieces will be, you know, more or less expensive. You can see 0.011 is here for 100 pieces, and point, uh, one four two is here. So. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't sort by the quantities higher than one. It's, it's a sorting based upon the price of one. And you need to keep that in mind because sometimes you might have uh, a board that, that requires 10 pieces of the same capacitor. So you're going to get a price break and a fairly substantial one too when you order more than one. And then you can scroll horizontally and see things like a capacitance and voltage and all that and usually if it's an especially low ESR it'll say the value here it's 0.7 ohms and then of course it'll give you the information this is a 2000 hour so if you look at all 2000 2000 2000 so the 5000 this is the only one and so that's why it jumped us directly to the product page because for this size and the other data, this is the only one that was rated at um, 5,000 hour. But the other thing is ripple current because this is directly related to ESR, ripple current here. And the higher the ripple current, the lower the ESR is. So you can see here that this is fairly low compared to the others, right? This is especially low here. Most of them are over 100. So this one has a pretty high ESR.
it's only 39 milliamps ripple there and uh, then back to this one you know this isn't necessarily bad and it, it really depends on what ESR that you're shooting for and that kind of gets our story a little bit complicated here but basically whenever you're choosing capacitors uh, that's that's how I go about it I take all of this into consideration and if ESR really doesn't matter in your application then by all means go with the high hour part and then you can check out the data sheet and look more in detail at uh, the individual specifications especially the physical size because as I told you before you need to measure not only your stock capacitors but measure the space around because if you cannot find the exact body size replacement capacitor that matches your stock one if your replacement's bigger then you want to make sure you have enough space to accommodate that not only physical space for the capacitor but also the pads you want to make sure those pads are going to match up with the feet here so you can solder it on without problem okay let's now take a look at the manufacturers this was another question that I was asked uh, how do you choose between manufacturers or is that important at all well I think it's important but when you're buying from Mauser and of course DigiKey a lot of the capacitors that are listed are the big name brands they're not Chinese knockoffs or the the low-end brands that nobody wants and so if we just look at this list this is not a comprehensive list but for the capacitors that we've chosen here aluminum electrolytics uh, for this particular 47 microfarad value we see Panasonic, that's Japanese. We see Nichicon, that's Japanese. I think most of you probably know this name. It's, it's a quite a, a famous name in capacitors. But Panasonic, you know, it's on the same level, really. United Chemicon is actually Japanese. And if you look at the United Chemicon webpage, you'll see that Nippon Chemicon, which is a Japanese company, is actually the parent company. So this child company, United Chemicon, is just the um, overseas distributor the distribution outside Japan basically uh, but United Chemicon is Nippon Chemicon essentially and it is Japanese quality capacitors uh, they may not be as highly regarded as Nichicon and Panasonic in the minds of some but really when you're talking about Japanese quality it really does uh, go from one company to the next Panasonic Nichicon United Chemicon you can really trust them all on the same level and look look what we see here the most popular are those three then we go down here to uh, Leilon I don't know how to pronounce it Leilon Leilon that's Taiwanese so from Taiwan that's not necessarily bad mind you and uh, in my own company we buy a lot of our products from Taiwan instead of China because Taiwan uh, gives a uh, higher eye to uh, quality but it's actually much less to manufacture in Taiwan than it is in Japan but in terms of the, the famous names, you know, I mean, Lilan is, is, uh, comes far after the Japanese brands. We already covered Nichicon, Panasonic, Rubicon, another Japanese name. And Worth. Worth is German. So there's nothing wrong with Worth. Uh, here's a Worth capacitor. They're typically this pinkish red color, the markings on them, and WE is, is the marking on the capacitor itself. I've bought many a Worth capacitor. You'll find them in my Mauser carts for many of my recapping videos, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with them. They, they, have, they offer fewer parts overall than some of these big-name brands like Nichicon and Panasonic. And so that's really one thing. But sometimes you will only find a Worth capacitor when you're searching. I mean, I've been hit with that many times. I'll be searching for a certain set of criterion, you know, setting up these filters, and the only one will, that will be there is the Worth. So it seems like they... I can't say if this is true or not, but it seems like they're trying to fill a gap where, where the other manufacturers haven't made a part um, that's a certain size or certain specifications. They, they want to be competitive by offering that differentiating point. Hey, hey, we have this part where the other manufacturers don't. And that's why for my analog board recapping uh, parts list, you, you find a lot of uh, worth electronic capacitors in there. It's a good balance. I mean, price isn't so bad, and, and you can find a lot of high-hour capacitors. In this case, it's only 2,000 hours, but many times you can find very high 
high hour uh, worth capacitors. But German quality, you know, if you want to talk about quality, German quality is very much on par with Japanese quality. So uh, you can trust worth, even if you may not be as familiar with that name as you are with something like Nichikon. Let me now give you one practical recapping example. This is Macintosh SE30 motherboard, and you might say, wow, <laughs> that's a little bit unsightly. Who did that? And the answer is me. This was one of the first recapping jobs I ever did, uh, on, and it was the SE30 motherboard. And you might say, well, my goodness, why in the world did you do it this way? It looks terrible, and it, it does look terrible. Admittedly, it does. It works. It's electronically sound. And I've seen other people do it somewhat similar to this. Uh, most people actually do it in an inferior way. They leave the capacitors. These are radial capacitors, by the way. They leave the capacitor standing straight up on the legs, and they don't use any hot glue. I put hot glue on it because I didn't want the, uh, the little pads to snap off. Anyway, the reason why I did it like this is because it was my first recapping job. That was before I had any exper experience buying from Mauser DigiKey, and I had some parts in stock, some uh, Jameco. Uh, I, many, many years ago, I would purchased some Jameco capacitor uh, cabinets, little drawers filled with components, and I had all the capacitors I needed. So I just said, well, I'm going to give it a shot and see how it goes, and it still works to this day. Yes, and this is exactly how it looks. Um, it's, well, not beautiful, but even though these capacitors are not Nichicons, these capacitors are probably some pretty low-end low Chinese makes, they still actually work. They do. And you can see here, uh, if we look here at uh, this guy, this was originally an Axial that went here. And I replaced it with a radio. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can actually do that. You just have to make sure that the height isn't going to cause problems when you're putting the motherboard back in, there, there is a height limit, and you have to watch out for that. But uh, all of these capacitors, you know, this one's standing straight up, and there was no problem with that. But the others I leaned down for reasons of better protecting them from breaking off the p traces, but also to make sure I had enough height clearance to get the circuit board back in. And, uh, Eventually, I did another recap, and this is one that looks more beautiful. Actually, these orange parts in this section here are stock chips, and the replacement tantalum parts that I have here are a nice yellow that kind of matches those. And by the way, these filters back here are also yellow. So it kind of, you know, I don't know how many of you like color-coordinated circuit boards, but to me, this looks very lovely. And if we zoom in, we can see here that I did replace the axial capacitors uh, this uh, at the time i this was my i think it was 2006 i didn't make time to look up when exactly i did it but it, it was quite a number of years ago and i purchased a capacitor kit from a fellow member of the 68k mla at the time and he included all the capacitors necessary all the tantalums and, and including these guys uh, these radio these no name brand guys and um, well these capacitors work but uh, I did the, the easy way. You can kind of see here a little bit of a clump of solder there. And that's because I clipped off the old capacitor and left the legs. This is a multi-layered board. So it's difficult to get out to fully desolder those. And um, I didn't want to risk damaging anything. That was many, many years ago. And so I just used the existing legs. In fact, if you don't have a lot of soldering experience, I would suggest you actually do it this way. It'll save you not only a lot of time, but you will avoid accidents too. But really, in terms of how you should recap, this is what I deem to be a good recapping job. And then if we look, here is the backside of the board. And on these components, none of these need to be replaced because even though you see C74, C70, C standing for capacitors, uh, they are teensy tiny little capacitors that are um, 
ceramics and you don't need to worry about those. Those don't go bad over time. And if you're wondering why this is burned, it's because I had sent it off for repair. Since I couldn't repair it myself at the time, somebody else accidentally had his heat gun on the fritz and uh, it did this. But it didn't damage anything, thankfully. So that's all I will say about that. But uh, yeah, on the bottom, bottom side of the board, you don't have to replace these components unless in a very, very, very rare case, um, one of them is bad. And the good news is you can find schematics online. I'll put a link in the text description below for the SE30 motherboard. I've actually never done a video on the recapping of an SE30 motherboard uh, because all of my boards are <laughs> recapped. However, I know I need to do one for you one of these days, so I might as well just uh, do some preliminaries for you by giving you an example of, okay, let's say I'm going to set out recapping this board. You could go and go to a place uh, like Console 5. Here's their website. I've never purchased from them before, but I know that some of you in the vintage Mac community have, and it's not just restricted to Macs, but, you know, Commodore 64s, whatever, basically. They don't have everything. They don't have recapping kits for some floppy drives, and I've recapped those before. So you want to check my videos first because I probably have Mauser carts that are not, you know, on here. And these guys are not affiliated with Mauser. They buy their own capacitors and, and do that. But basically, you type in SD30. And then you'll see some power supply kits, uh, analog, power supply, you can buy a Torx from them. Uh, they are not sponsoring this video, and again, I've never purchased from them before, but I'm just mentioning it because many of you know who they are. But uh, you can see here, main PCB means motherboard, it means logic board, and what, they have two different kits. One is an electrolytic kit. Why you'd want to do that, I don't know. Okay, I'd know. You want to make it look stock, okay? So fine. You can use that. It's cheap, right? Six dollars. I mean, you know, these guys, they have very competitive pricing. I'll give them that. And then you have the tantalum capacitor kit, which is these beautiful little capacitors, just like I showed you, and you're going to be paying about double because tantalum are more expensive, right? And pay, pay, pay by PayPal and all of that. You, you, you should write them and ask them, you know, what exactly the, are the part numbers that you're using. But I'm sure that they are quite comparable to what I used here. And these are solid tantalum capacitors, and you can know that because on this, this little mark that looks like a letter A, it's all filled in. It's solid colored. And they have polymer versions that are not solid, and I'll show that to you on Mauser in a few moments. But I've already recapped this with tantalum capacitors. But this one is kind of a bad job, so maybe I should recap this with more beautiful capacitors. However, I will just say that there's actually a problem here. Not a problem in functionality. All these years it's worked fine and it's still working fine to this day. Even with lots of RAM and lots of uh, accelerators working in it, I've never had a problem with these tantalum capacitors. I say that to the chagrin of tantalum haters. Yeah, there are a lot of highly experienced technicians and even engineers out there who hate tantalum. And you will come across those people in the online forums. But if tantalums were as defective as the tantalum say haters say they are, they wouldn't be sold today. You just have to be careful. Voltage spikes can kill these guys. And when they're killed, they fail in a short circuit and they burn. Yeah, flames will come out. So it could actually damage some of the surrounding components too. And that's why I wanted to say there's actually a problem here because there are 47, 10 pieces of 47, you'll see here 476, 10 pieces of 476 four, on there and five of those actually see 12 volts. The other five pieces only see five volts. So there's a voltage issue. So I'll show you the issue here on the Mauser, Mauser site. Let's, let's choose tantalum capacitors this time. We're, we are, I did another search here for 47 microfarad and 
we want to do we want to look up the same type of capacitors that I use for my recap, which are solid SMD. And then we can see those parts, 476 is telling us 47 is 47, and then the voltage is 16. And then we're going to choose 20% here, in stock and active. Um, we'll go ahead and apply those filters. We can see that uh, we've got some AVX parts here. We can go ahead and limit that to AVX actually. So we'll go ahead and just do one. And by the way, the you know that's I don't really like this, but this is definitely, if we can search for 47 on this page here, see it's 47 microfarad, 47 in the part number, but they're showing a 68 there. So this picture isn't exactly the part, okay? But we'll take a look inside the data sheet for those capacitors. And we can see here the AVX logo is filled in. If it's not filled in, then it's a polymer version of the tantalum capacitor. And that is important because uh, there is something called a D rating. Now here's the AVX website. It's saying that the D rating for solid tantalum capacitors is 50%. And then we have polymer capacitors have only 20%. Now, what is the D rating? Well, let's go back to this page. It says here the voltage rating of this capacitor, which is, by the way, the same capacitor as these here. These are rated at 16 volts, just like this. This means that's the maximum voltage rating of this capacitor, of these capacitors. And so, a 50% D rating means you cut this in half. You multiply it by 0.5. You take 50% of 16. What's half of 16? 8. Okay, so that means you can get a maximum of 8 volts on this to remain within its manufacturer specifications. Any voltage that's higher than that goes outside the manufacturer specifications and basically increases the failure rate, it's still fairly low, but you're increasing the risk of a fireball. That's a 50% D rating. Now, we just read polymer capacitors, polymer tantalum, have a 20% D rating. What does that mean? Multiply this by 0.8. Okay, so that's uh, what, 12.8? So you can safely run 12.8 volts continuously across a polymer version of this and it'll be just fine. So what's the problem? Well, I, when I did this, this was way back when, and there was a guy on the 68K MLA, he was, you know, I, he's a friend of mine, I'm not saying anything negative against him. There wasn't sufficient research done at the time to determine the voltage across each of these capacitors, but I did the, the research and, you know, schematic, since we have a schematic, I checked it all out, and five of these only see five volts. Five of the ten. But the other five see 12 volts. And that's a problem. Now, three of the five will see 12 volts almost continuously. Two of the five are the audio circuit capacitors, and they will only see peaks of 12 volts but still they'll see 12 volts. And so it's necessary for reasons of being within manufacturer specifications to better ensure that none of these capacitors were ever, are ever going to go up in a fireball to replace the five in question. And I'll give you a list later on in this video, but to replace the five with polymer versions. So we would choose on Mauser tantalum capacitors polymer.
And of course we want surface mount. And we know that the voltage across the seven, uh, on this board, what's coming in is five volts and 12 volts. It, it can be a little bit higher than 12. It's not gonna be 13, might be 12.6, but uh, it's not going to be 12.8. And so we can say, all right, if we get a 16 volt polymer capacitor, then that's going to fit. You could go higher, assuming that the case size will fit the pads. And that is really the key. Because this is just about, in terms of the length of the capacitor, it's just about seven millimeters. And so if we go up in voltage, you probably can go up as high as 20, but uh, we need to make sure that we choose a capacitor that will be solderable. See this guy here? This guy is, <laughs> he's made for wave soldering. He's not made for hand soldering. So the, the pads are on the bottom. You need a little, you need a, a metal piece that comes out on the sides. So you would not want to choose this guy. But this guy here is a different matter altogether. He is, this is Kimmet brand, so he's in black. But basically it's the same type of capacitor I have here. You've got this little metal part that comes out the side so your solder can flow onto him. And this is the type of capacitor you want. So this is about four millimeter height here. So you, the, this is all part of the process, folks. You know, just like here, you can see, looks like the top of an H here, right? That's enough. In fact, that's exactly how these capacitors are shaped. So when you're, when you're choosing your replacements, um, you need to give due consideration of, of that to make sure that the size of the capacitor is right. All we need is 20. And I'm not going to worry about the temperature because 105 is the minimum here. And it says, what's the height, you know, of the capacitor that you want? Obviously, if it's really, really one of these skinny guys, it's not going to, it's not going to solder in there very well. So we can actually set that. I'll put it in stock, active. And we'll get these and see what it does. And let's take a look at the AVX. Okay, so we've got one in the, I mean, color really doesn't matter, folks. So don't give too much of an eye to it. But if I, if I want one, I can do that. It says it's polymer, but this picture is wrong. I told you it was wrong before on the other one. So don't go by the picture, folks. Don't go by the picture. Go by the data sheet and the specifications. That's very important. If we look at the data sheet on these guys, you can see here, look at the polymer logo, right? You can see here, it is just an outline. Whereas this guy, he is solid. So solid tantalum has a solid Star Trek logo, basically, right? It looks like a Star Trek badge there from the original series. Uh, and this, this is not solid. It's more of a hollowed out. Looks like somebody's going to write the letter A, except they don't put the little horizontal line in there. That's polymer. So that's how you tell the difference between the two, just by looking at the circuit board. If you've got a circuit board and you know it's AVX, then this is solid tantalum. This is polymer tantalum. Polymer tantalum has the 80% D rating. So if we compare the solid tantalum ESR, it's 200 milliohms, which is less than your aluminum electrolytics, by the way. And the polymer is lower still at 70 milliohms. Now this isn't the ab absolute lowest. You can go even lower if you get something like ceramic. You would not want to recap your SE30 motherboard with ceramic because ceramics are you know, they're very expensive at high capacitance sizes and they have a voltage derating that is, um, well, we'll just say very, very restrictive. So you would not use ceramics for these. You basically only have the choice of um, solid tantalum, polymer tantalum, or organic 
uh, aluminum electrolytic, which is polymer aluminum electrolytic, or regular uh, electrolytics. But anyway, these, this 70 milliohms is quite low. A ceramic might give you as low as 8, eight milliohms, um, maybe even 5. But you don't really need that low because the stock capacitors were uh, quite high, probably close to an ohm or a little bit more, actually. But I'm just saying that the polymers are going to have lower ESR, which overall in, in this particular application uh, is a good thing. However, there is something called leakage current. And on a solid tantalum capacitor, it's very comparable to a aluminum electrolytic with fluid inside. It's very low. 7.5 microamps is nothing, folks. It's really, really tiny. But the polymer is 75. Yeah, you, you read it right. 7.5 <laughs> versus 75. So it has more leakage. Will it matter? Well, in this case, no, because we're talking about an SE30 motherboard that's plugged into wall socket power. It's not a battery powered board. But whenever you have a battery powered device like a smartphone, leakage current is going to be draining your battery faster. So, you know, th there are other considerations too that it might affect something, but I have done the circuit analysis and this leakage is not going to affect uh, the SE30 motherboard uh, at all. So you don't really need to be concerned about it. We can see here the length is 7.3 millimeters. So both are 7.3. In terms of the pricing, you need 10. So we're going to look at this. Solid tantalum, $1.35. Interestingly enough, <laughs> polymer is cheaper, $1.29. You know, I didn't go through all of the other uh, variants of so solid tantalum. And before you actually buy something, you want to make sure that you're getting the I don't want to say the cheapest one, but the one in the price range that you want in accordance with the specifications that you have. So probably if I go through the list, I can find one that's a little bit cheaper than this in the 10-piece quantity that has the same, uh, same specifications. Yeah, packaging plays a, a role, folks. So it is possible to find uh, some cheaper ones. But in this case, between these two capacitors, this, you know, you're going to need to expect to pay for tantalum more than a dollar. That's for sure when you buy these. Here is the 60K, 68K MLA. I started this thread on December the 10th, 2020. And this, if you want to read it, I'll put a link in the text description below for you. But basically, it covers the audio system, which is what this schematic is talking about. I also talk about the D rating in detail. And I also mentioned that uh, these five capacitors, C1, 7, 8, 12, and 13, only C5 volts. And the other capacitors, C9 and C10, are definitely out of spec because they see 12 volts. And then later in the thread, we determined that C3, C4, and C5 also will see 12 volts. So C9, 10, 3, 4, and 5 are the ones that need to be polymer capacitors, polymer tantalum, if you're going to recap with tantalum, it's very important to uh, use polymer for those five. And honestly, if you're starting fresh and not just fixing a board like this, buy all of them polymer, including the one microfarad guy. Get all of them in a polymer tantalum. And that way, you know, if you buy five solids and five polymers, you're going to get the one piece quantity price. So you want to you want to buy 10 where possible to get that lower price point. And again, don't forget, you know, ignore this picture. It, it, it's annoying me. I'm upset about it. I wish Mauser would put the correct picture there, but they don't. So don't let this confuse you. Please don't let that confuse you. And then you can put, it, it limits the characters quite a bit, but I understand why they do it because they only have a certain amount of space. But you can say SE30 and then see whatever I, I don't know if they let, let's see uh, okay so that's that's all the characters that will let you do now, these are not the capacitors that I that you need to change out but I'm just showing you there's a limited number of, of uh, characters there so you can put in whatever customer number you want but you could just say SE30 47 microfarad caps. And actually, you may not even need to say that at all because 
it's pretty obvious on the on the package it's going to say that these are 47 micros but if you're buying a lot of different capacitors for a lot of different projects it's probably a good idea to include SC30 in there uh, when you purchase and then when you want to buy then you can put your multiple there and it tells you the extended price and then you click buy and it'll add it to the cart and the last thing I'll say there's a lot more I could say about Mauser but I don't want to make this video too long and bore all of you so um, Niobium Oxide, I've done a video on these. Basically, you can use these, and these are preferred over, tant over solid tantalum. It's kind of like using polymer, except um, these are even better because th the failure mode of these is not a short circuit. Polymer capacitors have a failure mode that's better than solid tantalum in that it usually will result in high leakage current but still, sometimes you might get a short. However, they usually don't go up in flames. These will be a dead short, definitely, and they will go up in flames. And what triggers it is over-voltage. But if the ne niobium oxide capacitors see an over-voltage case, they're not going to go up in flames, and they're not going to be a, a dead sh short. So you might say, why can't I use these instead of tantalum everywhere? And the reason why is because they're limited to about 10 volts. <laughs> so most of the time, you can't use these. And for, for reasons that I won't go into into detail, you, you, you don't really want to use the ceramics either. Uh, film caps can be used on certain, like the analog board on a SC30 or, or something like that. I don't want to give you, you know, th this video is how to choose uh, parts, but basically film capacitors are f for really high voltage applications as opposed to what we're talking about now in this example for of the SC30 motherboard, which is 12 volts and 5 volts, so it's really unnecessary, and you wouldn't find the parts that you need there, and they'd be too big anyway. So the last thing I'll say is um, for the... What about polymer capacitors? Now, we just talked about polymer tantalum, right? But what about aluminum organic polymer? You can recap your SE30 motherboard with these. You'll need surface mount, and you want 16 volts, and we don't need to choose the ESR, and the minimum temperature is already 105. And then it's just a matter of choosing the diameter to know what you want, and then you can choose, say, if you want 4,000 hours, in stock, active, apply, and see what we get. And it says there's only one cap that will be suitable. And it says diameter is 5 millimeters. Length is 5.8. OK, 4,000 hour ripple current, 550. So. Uh, Overall, ESR 80 milliamps. So this is comparable to the polymer tantalum. Polymer tantalum is a little bit lower than this. And uh, really, it's, you know, it's going to give you a stock look. Uh, if we look at the data sheet. Okay. That's what we have to worry about. This is the only one it gave us for that criterion, and it's a hybrid. Hybrid means it's not solid. It's just a hybrid electrolyte. So there is, it's polymer, but it's liquid. And it's going to be very similar to the electro, liquid electrolyte aluminum electrolytics. In that, eventually, this liquid electrolyte is going to... Uh, even if it doesn't leak out, it's 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 going to have it's going to limit the life of the capacitor. Now, four thousand hours is a long time, but compare that to a solid electrolyte, which has no fluid in it at all, and can the theoretically last as long as the life of the motherboard. Right? The these polymer aluminum electrolytic capacitors do come in a solid type, without the word hybrid. And if you can find those, then yeah, recapping with those would be fine. But I would not, I, if you have a choice between polymer tantalum or polymer hybrid aluminum electrolytics for recapping something like the SE30 motherboard, which would I choose? I would definitely go with the tantalum. I don't want a fluid electrolyte. 
So, but don't let the shape of the can fool you. Uh, the, the same shaped uh, capacitors can also be found in a solid electrolyte. You just have to search for it. I just wanted to mention that uh, on this video so that you are aware of it. If you're thinking, okay, I want the stock look, what are the caveats to that? And, that, and the caveats are, well, you, you might only be able to find a hybrid type. And it doesn't say the word, I'll search for it. Yeah, it doesn't say it here at all. So definitely, definitely, before you buy anything, always check the data sheets, right? Because the data sheets will tell you that important piece of information. And of course, as I showed you before, <laughs> don't follow the picture on the Mauser webpage, follow the data sheet picture. And so this logo is gonna confirm that you have a polymer uh, capacitor. And then you can set out to recap your SC30 motherboard. I will give you a Mauser cart for the SC30 motherboard that includes polymer tantalum capacitors for all 10 pieces of the 47 microfarad. And then of course, this little guy here at C6 as well, so that you can get started. And as far as I know, everybody who does tantalum uses these solid guys. And that's a problem for reasons I just mentioned. So I think this will probably be the you know, th there are other people who use polymer tantalum capacitors, but many of them just use it because they assumed it would be better. <laughs> but that, there's actually a good reason for it. You know, some of them see uh, high voltage and there is a 50% a uh, D rating. And so there are a lot of considerations when you're going to get on Mauser and you're going to start looking for capacitors. And it's difficult to, to cover every possible case uh, in this video. But I would say that if you have any usage questions, that I've not mentioned already, uh, please leave a comment down below and let me know your thoughts. And there you have it, folks. If you found this video useful, please consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. If you'd like to support this channel, we have a PayPal link in the text description below. Uh, feel free to offer your comments and feedback. Any questions you have in the comment section, I enjoy engaging uh, everyone in the comment section. I'm not one of those YouTubers who ignore people who make a comment. I try my best to read and reply to every comment actually. So I'm happy to engage you there. I cannot guarantee that I'm going to be able to solve every problem you may have. Uh, just keep in mind that this video is giving general advice on how to recap your boards and recapping is not a magic solution for every type of problem but for many type of boards it is it can uh, actually restore your vintage electronic device into usable condition again thank you for watching and i wish each and every one of you a great day